and welcome to Rock Creek Online. Thank you for joining us today. In just a moment, we're going to hear a great talk. But first, take a minute and let us know where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know we've been praying for you, and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. Just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love for you to join us in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. Thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, welcome again. I'm so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from, whether it's our YouTube page, Facebook, social media. Hey, if you're on social media, do us a favor. Let us know where you're watching from, who you're watching with, and uh, maybe how your week's been, and we'll make sure to, to talk with you in the comments. But we're continuing our, our brand new teaching series called For Better or For Worse. And I know what you're thinking. You might be watching today and you're not married, or maybe you're in a dating relationship, or maybe you're just single, and not even looking to mingle, you're just single. Is, does this, is this relevant for you today? And the answer is yes. This entire teaching series is really about strengthening all relationships, whether it's our relationship with God, relationship with a spouse, uh, friendship, uh, even those working relationships, especially those kiddos. And so today I'm super excited because I think this is a relevant message like never before. Um, if there was ever a more difficult time uh, to, to cover the subject, it's now. And it, really we're talking about parenting. And so how to strengthen that, that parent-child uh, relationship. And so whether you're a grandparent, a great-grandparent, a lot of our grandparents have been tapped back in to help parent, and so um, maybe this is round two for you. Whatever it is, I know that today, uh, by God's word and his spirit, uh, we're going to give you some pra practical tools, and not just tips, but strategies, so, some God principles that will help you uh, be the parent that God's called you to, to have the better part of parenting and not the worst part of parenting. So let me just give you the, uh, the uh, uh, upfront. This is a guilt-free message today. Okay, a lot of times when it comes to parenting, um, there's a lot of what we, we've probably heard this phrase, mom guilt, right? You leave, feel bad leaving your kids. And the other day, my wife and I were talking to a couple and they've had a baby and they said, we literally haven't been away from our baby for a year. And I'm like, what, what are you guys doing? Take an overnight or we'll watch your kid. Like, and, and the thought was this, we feel guilty for leaving them. And so as you watch today, and if, and if you're, as you're a parent thinking about your children, I, I want you to, to just be guilt-free today. Grandparents, regular parents, step-parents, this is a guilt-free, no-shame message. There's already enough of that in the world. I'm going to encourage the heaven in you and the hell out of you, okay? So let's just start with our theme scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Now this sounds really good, and on the surface you're looking at it going, wow, I, if I could just get them onto the right path, man, even when they get older, even when they don't make, like they'll never leave it. Now, now here's, the, here's the good news. This is a wisdom from the book of Proverbs. This isn't a, uh, necessarily a guarantee, but this is, hey, if you get them on the path, you have the best shot. Now, here's what I'll say. God had two perfect kids, Adam and Eve, in the perfect place in the perfect garden, in the perfect scenario, and they still sinned. So parents, guilt-free today, you can do the best you can, but at the end of the day, kids will be kids, they will make their own decisions, and so I wanna equip you to the best of my ability through God's word on how to get as close to this as possible. Uh, and then we're gonna fill in the gaps by God's grace. And so um, I, I entitled this next section, if you're taking notes, and you can download those if you're watching uh, on one of our uh, social media or, or website, you can download the notes. And I want you to, I'm gonna give you a bunch of notes today. So a bunch of fill-ins, I'll try to get to them all. Uh, but, but I call this old school parenting still works, or as we're gonna read, Old Testament uh, parenting still works. And so here it is in Deut Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Okay, so, so this is Moses talking to the people. You must obey them in the land that you are living or about to enter in and occupy. And you and your children, and here it is, and grandchildren, must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. Now, now okay, so basically make sure that God is priority number one. 
And if you do, here's, here's what it says. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. But what do you have to do? Fear God, obey his decrees and his commands, and you'll enjoy a long life. And so nothing has changed from this to our present day, except for some cultural things. I, I think if we were to take a, a broad look, and there's probably seven to eight things that are culturally shifting when it comes to parenting uh, and, and kids. And so I thought I'd just mention a couple because we're going to tackle one very specific one today. And the first one is that uh, a premature adulthood is happening. Like when you look at our kids, whether they're young, that preteen, teenager year, like we're, we're seeing uh, kids become adults prematurely. There are things that my kids at seven, eight, and nine are hearing, are, are, are seeing that, that I didn't even see until post high school, or conversations, or words, or, or uh, things that they're saying is true but aren't, like way earlier than we ever have seen it. I was talking with a, a grandparents the other day, and they said, man, the, the challenges you have as parents were nothing like we had when we were raising our kids, and I said, amen, I agree with you. And so whether you have young kids, old kids, grandkids, the, the stuff that they're facing is forcing them to be prematurely become adults. The other thing that we're seeing, and we're going to talk about this, this will be the primary conversation, is, is what I call cultural indoctrination. Okay, and so we see this particularly in the uh, public education system. And I put it this way, and it's not in your notes, but you can write this down. The, the school systems have gone from educating to indoctrination. Okay, and so, and so they're, they're taking theories and thoughts and, and, and stuff that has nothing to do with actually learning, but about life, whether it's what is male, what is female, right? You can be whatever you want to be, and this isn't a political statement, this is a reality. We learned a few weeks ago that God made them male and female, and th those are different. And so we're seeing this trend even in the education system where teachers are stalking your kids on Facebook. Your teachers are, are looking and, and opening doors that, that, that when I was a kid were never even open. I wouldn't have even known. There are terms that I have heard recently in the public school sector that as a 41-year-old man, I don't even know what they mean. And so uh, be careful Googling those terms that you don't know what they mean because you might see some stuff or hear some things that you never thought you'd see in this present age. All of that to say, this, there's, a, there's a way, an Old Testament, an old school parenting system that can combat that and fight against the cultural indoctrination. And so parents, hear my words, either you indoctrinate your kids or the world will. And so this isn't meant to scare you or frighten you. It's actually meant to redirect you to the source of how you can help your kids get on the path so that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. We, we see this later on in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord, here it is, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so the, the author is telling us, hey, make sure everything that is you has been given to the Lord. Your heart, your soul, and your strength. See, parents, a lot of times, especially in the Christian world, we, we work on the outside. The rules and regulations, the do's and the don'ts, and the music you can listen to and the music you can't, and the style of clothes you can wear and the style of clothes you can't. But the reality is, that's how culture looks at our life. It's how culture is trying to direct our kids. But I would say this, the ultimate goal is to get here, to the heart. Not their haircut, their heart. And if you can help capture the heart and soul and strength of a young person, your kids, your grandkids, you can direct them past the exterior influences that is culturally trying to shift them away from God and more into the world. And so again, the author is making it very clear what is the goal, that, that your kid's heart would belong to God, their soul would belong to God, their strength would be given to God and not to some other source in this world. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says it this way, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. 
Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You're probably thinking, what am I supposed to put on my forehead? What am I supposed to? So there, there's some spiritual dynamics at play here. And, and, and again, this is bonus. This will help you parents. But when it comes to reiterating God's best for your kids, to, to reiterating the commands that God has for you and your kids or grandkids or stepkids, it's right in here. And so I want you to see it. There's a, there's a moment here. When do you talk to your kids about them? You talk about them when you're at home. You talk to them about when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. And then you tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders of what God wants. So let me say it this way, at mealtime, it's a great time to have a conversation about what God wants us to do with our life. How about this, the drive time. Okay, I take my kids typically to school three days a week, and so it's in that drive time that honestly, as a parent sometimes, I just wanna zone out. But the Bible reminds us today in Deuteronomy, hey, make sure you take advantage of that drive time. Talk to them about the things of God. Spend a moment praying. The other day I was dropping my kids off and we were about 30 seconds away and my oldest Riker goes, Dad, you haven't prayed yet. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm doing better than I think. My kid is reminding me, the pastor, we haven't prayed yet, Dad, pray for us. And so I took prayer requests and, and said, hurry up, hurry up, we're about to go. And so I prayed, real, my, and, and so I prayed a short prayer but I believe God answers short prayers from faithful servants, and so I prayed my best short prayer and sent them on their way in the drive time. You know what else? The bedtime. This is the time that honestly most parents are like, go to bed, the day is over. At least that's what I say sometimes at the end of the day. This day is over, okay, and bedtime. And guess what? They just want to get up. Dad, I need some water. Dad, read me another story. Hey, Dad, I forgot to go to the bathroom. No, you went. No, I have to go again. Like, so they want to be up. So take that bedtime and use it as an opportunity to, again, reiterate the commands that God has for them. And then the get ready time. The get ready time. My wife, growing up, we would have these conversations. She said it was in her getting ready time where her mom would come and talk to her about the things that were going on in her life and the spiritual things that God had for her. And, and so we're seeing that same trend even with our daughter that is in that getting ready time that there's this special moment as a parent that you can actually uh, uh, get involved into the heart issues of your children. And so it's in those special times, the, the getting up, the eating, the driving, and the getting ready for, for a lifetime that's really, really important. Deuteronomy 6, 20 and 21 says it this way, in the future, your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Here it is, parents. Here it is, grandparents. Then you must tell them we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. So, so what is it that you're saying? You're saying God is powerful. God wants to take where you are and put you where he wants you to be. That God has done some things in my life, and so if God has done some things in my life, he wants to do them in your life. And as you follow his decrees and, and laws, commands, you're gonna see God work in you and through you. See, as we discovered in that last scripture about the, the forehead, what's written on the forehead and the hands, the hands are all about action. The forehead means your thinking. And so when you get your thinking right, it will lead to right action. And so parents, grandparents, step-parents, hear my words. The goal is to get into the heart of your child so that they understand and think the way that God wants them to think. And in turn, they will live out actions that are godly, that are valuable in God's eyes, not the world's eyes. Because again, the cultural shift is trying to become the parent for you. And so if you don't parent your kids, the world will. If you don't indoctrinate your kids in the decrees and laws, commands of God, the world will give them something else to follow and that something else is not God's best for them. And so we have to shift this strategy from, from actually preparing the road for the kids and actually preparing our kids for any road. Not just a road, but any road that they travel on because there are more roads to choose from than you can imagine these days for our children. And so our job, again, is to prepare them for whatever road they find themselves on. Smooth, bumpy, windy, twisting, detoured, traffic, whatever it is. Like, we, we are to prepare them for any road, not just the road. 
And as we do that, I believe God will help us. And so how do we influence our kids spiritually in what I call an oppositional world? Because if there was ever a day and age that there was opposition to godly, driven values, to godly character being uh, created in a, in a human being, uh, just faith in general, church, Jesus, religion, all of that, if there was ever an opposition, it's now that we're facing. So, so I wanna give you just a quick seven thoughts on how to influence your kids spiritually. Here's the first, the first one. You gotta start with stability. The stable foundation in which you build upon is critical. Deuteronomy 6.2 says it this way, and you and your children and your grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life, a long life. And so we gotta build upon what foundation? God's word. We don't worship the word, but we build our life upon it because it's the guardrails of our life. It's the boundaries in the banks. If our life was a river, it's the boundaries in which we live. But the, the interesting thing is that there are some things that you need to know about kids. And so there are some phases that, that psychologists have talked about over the years. And so I thought I would give them to you real quick. Here's how it works when it comes to your kids. Okay, we have the discovery phase. And then we have this testing phase, and then we have conclusions that they make. And so we see this discovery phase beginning at birth and moving to about six years old, where they're just discovering, what are they discovering? Everything and anything. They're just looking at the world and, and just discovering everything that's new. And then we move into this testing phase, which is at seven to 10, where they actually are testing what they've discovered. And so we see a lot of people in this phase, especially if you got boys, uh, uh, taken up resident at urgent care, right? Why? Because they are testing everything that they have discovered in those earlier years. And so they're like, what would it look like to jump off the top of the playground at, at the school? Boom, broken arm, right? Like you live there. And that's, that's the lane that I'm currently in. And then we have these conclusions, which is at 10 years old, they go, I have decided what's right and what's wrong. And that's what we call elementary, okay? In this elementary age, this this birth through 10, this discovery, they're just, everything's new. They're testing what they've discovered, and ultimately they arrive at some conclusions, but then they move from elementary to adolescence. And so if you have some, some adolescent people, you know what I'm talking about, and guess what? This repeats again. And we see this discovery again from about ages 11 to 13, where they're what? Everything's new. They, they've, they've forgotten all that they learned up until 10. They start over. Everything's new. Come on, teen, preteens, 11 to 13. And then from 14 to 18, they're testing what they've discovered. Again, everything is starting over. Everything is new. And then about 18 or 30, they come to conclusions about what they've tested and what they've discovered. And this is why it can be frustrating as a parent because there are these stages of learning and discovery and testing that, that, that start once and then they start again. And so the foundation in which we build on must be stable as they go through these phases because these are unstable. And so if you start with what's, what's stable, which is God's word, relationship with him, you can make it through this, these, these seasons of discovery, testing, conclusions. Got to start with being stabil, stable in your life. Number two, you got to cultivate what I call close connection. You want to you uh, uh, come after the cultural trends in, in, in opposition to God with your kids. Cultivate close connection. Now, now, here's the bummer news. Let me give you the stat. There was a study that came out recently that dads, okay, spend on average, this is a, a recent study, 37 seconds having close communication with their kids. Come on, dads. We gotta do better than that, 37 seconds. 37 seconds, now I'm the first to admit that there are moments in my life where I just wanna tune out the kids and as a dad, as a man, it's easy to do that. We don't have a lot of words and so we don't use very many of them. But, but that, is, that is not gonna get the job done. Romans 12, 10 says it this way, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. There's gotta be a moment where you closely connect with your kids, your grandkids, your stepkids, not just 37 seconds in a day, but close conversation. Remember in those meal times, the getting up times, the preparing times, the travel time. You have to get to a place where you actually have relationship because here, here's what will happen if you don't, and I wanna give you my quote. Rules without relationship will always lead to rebellion. This is a fact. Rules without relationship will always lead to rebellion. 
Not rebellion on the outside, but rebellion starts in the heart. Remember, we're after the heart of our kids, not their haircut. Rules without relationship will always lead to rebellion. I put it this way, correction without connection will always be disruptive. So dad, mom, stepdad, stepmom, grandparent, when you correct before you've connected, it will always be disruptive in the life of your child. And so it has to be a close connection built on a stable foundation of God's word where we connected with them, we've listened to them, they, felt, they feel heard and accepted and loved. And so when we correct them, there's that connection that, that helps transcend the correction. So instead of disruptive, it's productive. So I wrote down just a couple thoughts based on that scripture in Romans 12 that I think will be helpful to you. How do we do this? How do we connect? Well, we connect with affection. By, by, by showing them that we love them, by affirming them. That means we don't just lie to them. Hey, you're the greatest football player when they're, no, but with genuine affirmation. We have this phrase I used to say at the beginning a few years ago, but now it's become a part of our mantra and ethos as a church that you're doing better than you think. We even made shirts with it, all, that phrase on the back, and I just love that thought because that's the true affirmation that when you look at your child and go, hey, I know it's hard, but you're doing better than you think. And then they begin to realize, oh, they actually believe that. I am doing better than I think. The shoulders go back, confidence gets instilled. The, the affirmation from a parent, a grandparent, a step parent, it, it, you can't buy that. It's gold. And, then, and this is the hardest one for some of us. Apologize when you're wrong. Apologize when you're wrong. Here's why apologizing when you're wrong is so powerful when it comes to your kids. Because here's what they'll do. If mom and dad can admit when they get it wrong and God can forgive them, I can admit when I get it wrong and God will forgive me. The other day I was driving and I had a bad driver. It wasn't me, it was someone else. And I'd use this phrase, idiot, in our car, which of course probably is not the best word to say, you idiot driver, right? And so then we're all as a family and uh, we were driving and my wife was in the car this time with our other uh, kiddos. So we had all three kids with us and someone had cut me off again. And so from the back row, my oldest, Riker, who's nine years old, says these emphatic words, what an idiot driver. <laughs> and my wife just looks over at me like, where do you hear that? And so it was in that moment that I learned to apologize <laughs> when you're wrong. And so I Later that day when we got home, I said, buddy, that's not the way that we talk. And my son looked at me and goes, well, that's the way you talk. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I said, well, dad's working on the way that he talks when bad drivers cut him off. So will you forgive me? He's like, dad, we all make mistakes. And I'm like, this was a great conversation. There's nothing more humbling to have your child correct you or acknowledge when you correct yourself. But honestly, I hope that he remembers that, that dad can ask and apologize for forgiveness. I can too. Number three, I want you to foster a motivational environment. Foster a motivational environment. Psalm 127 says it this way. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. So, so, so what do we do with our kids? We... We don't shoot them, okay, that's, that's not, if you said that out loud, you're, you're kind of wrong, but you're kind of right, they're, they're, they're an arrow in your hands. So, so here's what you do, you aim when you're shooting an arrow, which means you provide direction. And then once you, once you aim it, you pull it back, right? And, and, you, and that's the motivation, you provide motivation, and then ultimately you let go, which is you release them out. But the problem is, I think most probably well-meaning Christian parents are good at like two of these, which is probably the aim and, and probably releasing them or, or at some point kicking them out of your house, right? Uh, but it's the motivation that's wrong because we'll, we'll go, we aim them correctly, but they didn't go where we aimed them. So it's not an aiming problem, and especially in the church world, we've been really good at well, more rules, more regulations. It's not an aiming problem. It's a motivation problem. And so when we can get the motivation part right, when we aim, they'll go where we aim them, where we shoot them out into the world and go, you're on your own. We've given you everything that we've given you. And hopefully, with the right motivation, they'll go exactly 
where we aim them, which is what? On the path that God has for them, so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. But here's some motivational killers, and I've committed some of these, and maybe you'll relate to some of these as, as well, but the first one is when you lose your cool. When you lose your cool, also known as getting angry. Philippians 4.4, 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. So losing your cool with your kids will be a demotivator for them to, to be aimed at where you want them to go. Okay, the next one, and this is interesting, letting them intimidate you. There's nothing more intimidating sometimes in a, than a 14-year-old boy pushing the boundaries, or a girl pushing the boundaries in your world, going, will they stand firm on what they said? Will they hold true to what they said? When they said, if you're late, you're gonna be grounded. Will they hold true to it? And we can't let our kids intimidate us. 2 Timothy 1.7 says it this way, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Parent, grandparent, step-parent, hear me. You're strong in the Lord. Power, love, self-discipline. Don't be afraid. Don't be, don't be intimidated by those beautiful blessings you created. It'll kill the motivation in their life to move forward to where God has them. Number three, rescuing them from consequences. You wanna kill motivation? Then you always rescue them. Romans 15, 13 says it this way. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And so parent, I know you wanna rescue. I know you want to save. I know you wanna show up when they forgot their homework, forgot their lunch, or didn't study for a test, and they want you to call in sick for the, on their behalf, but don't do it. Don't rescue them. Don't be misled. Don't kill their motivation. Help them deal with the consequences of their decisions. Don't kill the motivation because when you aim them and when you pull them back and release them, we want them to go a particular way. But if you never let them feel the consequences of their decisions, they will not go where you aim them. Because ultimately, if you do that, it will lead to this, delay living. Delay living. See, many of us just make all the decisions. We, we helicopter parent, and I'm guilty of this at times too, and we delay them living until they're 18, and then when they get out of our house, we thought we aimed them, but we killed the motivation, and so they don't go where we want them to go, and they spend a season of rebellion because it was about rules and without relationship. We didn't connect before we corrected, and so we, we launched them into the world, and they go haphazardly on a different path. Romans 15, 13, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the goal, that they would have a source of hope that is not you because you've allowed them to deal with the consequences. You've aimed them, but you've motivated them. You've, you, you've worked hard on not losing your cool. And they discovered a foundation built on God's word for their life. That when the world says, go this way, truth is whatever you want it to be, they will come back and go, no, that's not the decrees and laws, commands of God because I've written them on my forehead and I've had them in my hands and I understand it. And we've had those meal times and getting ready times and come on, together times where mom and dad have not only apologized, but they've showed us what God can do in their life and so I've experienced it for myself. Which leads us to number four, give them heavy doses of encouragement. Your kids need doses, heavy doses of encouragement. Romans 12, 15 says it this way. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Parents, hear my words. Your kids are facing things you never had to face at their age. They're dealing with things at school, on social media, the most depressed and overmedicated generation ever to live is now. Young people, parents of young kids, hear me. Your kids, kids need heavy doses of encouragement. Heavy doses. D doses so much so that you actually like overwhelm them with you're doing better than you think. You're doing better than you think. And you keep saying it and rehearsing it and keep going after it because the world is discouraging them. They need parents, grandparents, step-parents who are getting involved in their life and encouraging heaven in them. Heaven's in them. Number five, I want you to have parents with dreams and a plan for your kiddos. See, a lot of parenting is kind of like flying a plane while you're still building it. But there's some things that we can do as parents that, that really are a biblical plan 
and dream for their life. And so if you had something that I was gonna give you, if something that I could help you understand, it's this, that you would give them confidence. That you would give them confidence. They say this, that the average kid has a self-image or confidence by the age of seven. Some of you are like, well my kids are 14. I missed the window. Listen, it's never too late. But I'm just saying, as a young parent with young kids, confidence is critical. 1 Timothy 4.14 says it this way, do not neglect the spiritual gift you received. Listen, if those little blessings your kids are a gift from God, don't neglect it, encourage them. Give them confidence, instill in them what the world will try to take away. Parents, you gotta also give them convictions. Convictions, where do we draw the line? What is the value in which we live by? See, because the world will give them values, but if they understand that the values in which they live gotta be based on God's word and his commands, decrees, and laws, then, then you will help them navigate that when values come up that are contrary to God's best for them, they'll go, no, 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 that's not the right decision because that's not the value in which I've been taught, the conviction in which I hold, whether they're a young kid or an 18-year-old. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.19 says it this way, cling to your faith in Christ. So you have a faith in Christ that, that gives them a conviction about what they do with their life. Because ultimately, convictions, come on parents, you've got to lead to a moment of character. Character development, character when no one else is looking. When you're not with your kids, when you're not on their phone with them, when they're on social media being influenced and, and being sent things and talked about things that you don't even know it's happening. What will be the thing that will drive them into God's best or away from God? And it's character. First Timothy 1.19 says this, keep your conscience clear. You know why it's important to have a close connection with your kids where they feel like they can talk to you about anything without being judged but, but living in grace because, because you want to keep their conscience clear. You want to get them to a place where they can have character that's developed that's Christ-like. And the only way to have that character developed is by having a conversation with their parent where they can go, this is what's really going on. This is what I'm really facing. This is what was said I don't know what this is, explain it to me, so that their conscience does not get seared or desensitized, but it stays clear and Christ-like. And I would say this, that, that, that a lot of well-meaning Christian parents are really good at these first couple. The confidence, the convictions, the character, but, but then it, you had to have some compassion. Teach your kids to have compassion. This is why there's so many mean Christians in the world, is that they forget actually, it's not just about us, it's about others. It's about making sure that others is, is important in our life, in our kids' life. Look what it says in 1 Timothy. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love. And so a lot of well-meaning Christians, parents, hear me, are really good at giving them confidence. Hey, we have convictions. This is what we value. This is where we're going to live life. Here's the boundaries of our life, which develops Christ-like character. But then there's no compassion. And so we make judgments at those who are outside of faith, we make judgments with those people within faith, and then we wonder why no one wants faith, because people who claim to follow Christ are mean, instead of filled with love. And so let your kids not be judgers, but let them be filled with grace, dispensers of grace in the world in which we live. I'm telling you, there's nothing more attractive, not in a phony fake or facade, but in an authentic, genuine way where people, especially young people, love others that are different from them. Love others that hold different values than them, but still hold the line on those values and still allow the, the Christ-like character to be developed. Because ultimately, parents, what we want, competence. We want our kids to go out in the world and fulfill the call and purpose of God for their life. 1 Timothy 4, 15, give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone will see your progress. Not perfection, that's unattainable, but progress. Parents, you want your kids to make progress, not perfection, progress. And in order to do that, they have to give themselves completely to it to become competent to be effective in walking out the godly values that you've instilled, to fear the Lord so that they can enjoy a long life, so that they can make a difference in this world, so they can be filled with love because you instilled confidence and a conviction 
and help them grow their character. Even when they fall short, they experience God's grace lifting them back up out of their shortcomings and imperfections so that, what, so that they can grow. You want to combat the cultural indoctrination? Man, this is the way to do it. And I think this, parents, you've got to expose your kids to significant examples and experiences. One of the reasons why we do things like our kids camp this last summer, and I should have brought a picture to show you the, some 40 plus hands of kids going up, surrendering their life to Christ. Why? Because those are ex- examples and experiences. Significant ones, big picture ones, where kids are marked by God for the rest of their life. That's why we believe in those moments and gatherings in students and young people and kids to make sure that they have these big, significant experiences where they go, whoa, God is bigger than I ever imagined. Mark 1, 17 says it this way. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. It's one of the reasons why I'm intentionally beginning to take my oldest to conferences and worship nights of favorite worship bands that are traveling to the cities that we live in. And why? Because I want them to have this moment where they see, whoa, the world is bigger than just me and have an experience with God that marks them forever. It's one thing to sit in church. It's another thing to have a spiritual moment, a mountaintop experience that goes, whoa, God's called me to more than just myself, but to fish for people, to be a disciple maker, even at a young age, to experience God and the reality of his presence. It marks them. So parents, work hard. Make an effort to show them examples in your life. One of my favorite moments, which is coming up, is water baptism. And one of my favorite moments in that water baptism is when I see families watch their family members get baptized. You can see the kids recently, as we had one where the parents were getting baptized and the kids were wide-eyed watching their mom or dad take spiritual steps publicly about their inner decision to follow Jesus. And I'm thinking, that, my friend, is the best part of today. I'm glad they made that decision. I'm glad they're publicly declaring their faith, but I'm glad their kids get to watch their mom and dad humbly get into a tank in front of the entire church and say, I am a follower of Jesus. What an example to give your kids. May our kids always see us changing by the grace of God so that they too can think if mom and dad can change, if grandma and grandpa can change, if Dan and papa can change, if stepdad and stepmom can change, then I can change too. I can change too. Because ultimately our job as parents is to point them to the future. To the future. To point them to a future filled with faith not failure, filled with hope, a calling, a purpose to be realized, potential to come to fruition. See, Jesus was the master at pointing people to the future. Mark 2, 5 says it this way. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. So parents, hear my words. When your kid messes up and they fall short of God's glorious standard, when they fall short of your glorious standard, make sure you're like Jesus and go remember who you are. It's not what you did, it's what Christ has done. You're forgiven, your sins have been washed away, the guilt and shame taken off of your life. Come on parents, our job is not to put shame on our kids, it's to remind them that the shame has been broken and taken off because of Jesus. Point them to a future, even when they fail. Give them faith. John 8, 11 says it this way. No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So our job, like Jesus, to point our kids to a preferred future filled with faith, even when they fail. And if we can do that, my gosh, there will be a generation filled with hope instead of drugs, filled with a future of faith instead of understanding and not sure what to do or who they are, what gender they are and where they're going with life. No, no, our job is to fill a future full of of young people that have faith and values that are based on God's word. And as we pull them back and aim, we'll motivate them and and the target will be hit. The target will be hit. It's my prayer for you. We're in the trenches together, this whole thing called parenting. And so wherever you're at today, I pray that the Spirit of God would encourage you as I pray for you. Would you join me? God, I thank you for every single parent watching. 
I pray for every single person watching that God in this moment, something today that was spoken would, would penetrate the very depths of our soul. That God, you would help us, help us invest in the next generation, help us to be the best mom and dad, stepmom and dad that you've called us to be. Help us to have grace in these times. Help us to be quick to remember, to point them to a preferred future filled with faith and hope even when they fall short, even when they fail. So I pray for every parent that feels like they failed their kid. I pray today you would encourage their heart, you strengthen their faith. God, you give them grace for the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. God, our time with our kids in our home are short, so I pray that we would make the most of them. In your name we pray, Jesus. And everyone watching said amen. Parents, people watching, I hope you were encouraged by today's talk. I would encourage you to go back. I gave you the fire hydrant of information and biblical truths. Go back, watch it again. We're going to continue to do more parenting talks just like this. So stay tuned and join us next weekend for a continuation of our series, For Better or For Worse. As we wrap up today, I want to encourage you to consider partnering with us financially. Your giving is making a difference. And we're so glad that you joined us. Thank you for your generosity. And as always, Rock Creek Church, you're doing better than you think. God bless.